What a wonderful, wonderful day it's already been, getting to connect with my friends, getting to connect with my family right here. So me and my wife, we get the privilege of pastoring this group of people. And so my name's Elliot, my wife's name's Tiffany, and this is our, this is our beautiful family. Come on, give it up for yourself, Lifeline Church. You are amazing. We love you. That's what I'm talking about right there. I love it so, so much. We got a mission here at the church. We like to talk about it every single week, even if just for a second. Our mission is to say it with me if you know it. It's to be a lifeline by leading people and becoming lifelong Jesus followers. Yes, that's our mission. And uh, so before we jump into the message today, I want to just remind you, some of you already know, some of you might not, that we have um, the YouVersion Bible app that you can download on your phone, and you can follow along with all the notes that are available throughout this message. We go through a lot of work. I should say we very loosely. Tiffany and team goes through a lot of work to put all those notes together and make sure that you can follow along and you can go on the YouVersion Bible app, tap events, and then go down to find Lifeline Church. You can even make Lifeline Church your church within that app. Really cool. Or if you've got, uh, you know, a pen and your Bible with you, like a good Christian folk right there. Like, I think you get extra points in heaven if you show up to church with your actual Bible. Come on, somebody. I got one person in the back that's like, that's right, right here. This is my Bible. I can do what it says I can do. Yeah, that's right. And we've got paper notes right there in the bulletin insert so you can follow along, take some notes, and, and do all that. And, uh, you know, we go through all that just so that you can remember and hopefully retain a lot of what we're talking about throughout the day. So we're starting a new series today. Come on, get excited, everybody. Come on, get excited. It's a new series today called Who Am I? Who Am I? Um, you might be like, well, uh, let me tell you about myself. No, this is, a, this is a series about our identity. Who am I? And, and what we're going to answer throughout the next six weeks is, who am I in Christ? Who am I when I feel like I've failed? Who am I when I feel like I don't measure up to the standard that's out there? Who am I when I'm compared to others? Who am I with my family? Who am I in these different areas of life? And I want to show you over the next six weeks that, that in the Bible, we can learn so much and really everything we need to know about our identity and who we are in Christ so we never have to struggle again with our identity and the fact that the world has pressure on us, stresses on us. We have insecurities that are unwarranted because you are a son and a daughter of the Most High God, and he has a plan for you. He has all of it written out in his word so that you can know and believe who you really are in Christ. Amen, everybody? It's going to be, I'm, I'm so fired up. This is my second most important series of the whole year. This is my second favorite series of the whole year. The, the first is, well, you just have to wait for it. It's coming up soon. All right, but this is my second favorite one. I'm just letting you know, letting you know that we've got some amazing things coming this year. I hope that you get really excited about it. Um, so this series, Who Am I? And we're starting life groups today, of course. Uh, you, some of you might know that because of all the pop-ups outside, and it just like started being sunny whatever, okay, it's like you're going to threaten rain, so all of our team's scrambling to set up all those pop-ups, and next thing you know, it's not even going to rain anymore, but whatever, we're going to sign up for some life groups today, and the first six weeks of all the different life groups you can choose from are going to be along this topic of who am I. Now, after the six weeks, it'll break off into different topics, different subjects, but whenever you sign up for a group out there, it's going to be around this book that we've got copies for everyone who signs up for a group. You get a copy of this book. And um, Tiffany and I are actually pretty close friends with the author of this book. And it just so happens that he sent me a video because he wanted to say thank you to everybody here. He wanted to say hello to our church. So go ahead and check this out. Check out this video from Pastor Jeff Little as we start this guys, series out. Pastor Jeff Little here. And I just want you to know that I'm excited about Lifeline Church and what God's doing there among you. Uh, just recently, your pastor, Elliot, was here with us. We had a lot of other pastors together, and we actually had a little small time with some pastors in a smaller setting. And I just want you to know your pastor loves you. Your pastor is a learner. He's a leader. He's excited about what God's doing with you, and he's talking about you and wanting to see you grow and become all that you're called to be. And so I've had people help me along the way. I love a chance to encourage him, and I'm excited about this journey as you're going to have the, the time of messages that your pastor is going to preach, and you have the small group, and then this book, Who Am I?, uh, is what you're going through. So I'm really honored and, and excited you're going to go through it. I thought I might give you just a little taste of what inspired me with it. 
I begin to see this question, who am I in the Bible? You know, Moses, who am I to have this great task for God? Or David, who am I that you're mindful of me? I'm, I see Peter, when Jesus asked him the who am I question, who do people say that I am? It's, it's a question we struggle with, but we really don't like to admit that we're working through our identity. And, and it, it comes on us at different times. You can conquer it, but go through a new season, a job transition, a, child, a problem with a child, and you're ask, asking that who am I question. And the Bible has answers for us to find our identity and who Christ says we are and who Jesus says we are. And you're going to journey through insecurity and and what, what do you do when you're successful and you and, and you, you have some wins, but you, you still feel empty and Solomon and it's Bible characters is what I love too. You're going to learn the Bible in this journey. And I just want you to know I'm cheering you on. I'm excited about it. I love you, pastor, praying for your church. And I just wanted to encourage you on this journey and just tell you, I know God's going to do amazing things. Amen. Amen, man. He's a, he may be a great pastor, but someone needs to teach him how to turn his phone sideways. Amen, somebody? Man, it's, it's new technology. It's new technology. Someone else ought to tell him that I'm actually the associate pastor to Tiffany. <laughs> someone ought to be real with him. Let him know that it's, uh, it's, I'm, I'm just the speaker. It's like, uh, it's like Paul and the sidekick who does all the speaking. That's what it's more real like. So someone ought to coach him up on that. Either way, uh, he's just a good friend of ours, and he's been so generous to us. Uh, over the last couple years and bringing us into his church, bringing us into his home and letting us kind of get a, get a feel for. So this book, this is not just something we pulled off the shelf. This is, this is in the family with us. This is uh, our friend who's doing all this. And I'm really excited uh, for these life groups that are starting because, you know, church is supposed to be a family. I don't know if you knew that. Church is supposed to be a family. Like families talk about life together. Families sit around the dinner table and talk about the hard things of life and, and they talk about the wins and the losses together. What we're doing here is like a reunion. You know, everybody's coming in and like, oh, do I know so-and-so? That's cousin so-and-so and I'm not really sure. And when one person stands up and talks about our heavenly father. But what we do, so what we do here is fun, it's easy, but going into groups, you know, that's, that's like around the dinner table and that's where intimacy happens. That's where like we get real connection is around that dinner table. So I want to invite every single person here to not leave this place today without putting your name on one of those lists out there and signing up for a group because you are going to you are going to benefit so much from what the church is really intended to be, a family. And you're going to get those connections. You're going to get that friendship from people. Um, don't, don't miss what I'm saying here. Um, and you might look at me and go, well, you know, that's easy for you to say. You love being around people. And let me just tell you something. This is not something I'm asking you to do that I don't do. I'm, I'm doing groups too. And let me tell you the truth about something. When I go into them sometimes, I'm, I'm sweating just like everybody else. I'm feeling uncomfortable. Like, oh, what, what if, you know, I'm not sure. I walk into the group and I feel a little uncomfortable. I'm looking for extra coffee to help me, you know, be more talkative, whatever. People think, you know, that, you know, I just, you know, get out of bed and angels pick me up. And they carry me in. Oh, Pastor Elliot, we want to give you a message for the people. No, I'm walking in. I'm feeling nervous too. But after I leave my life group, I always look back and go, that is what I needed. Amen. That is what I needed. I needed to hear that story today. I needed to hear, I needed that connection. I needed that bit of encouragement. And it's just like coming to church. Sometimes it's hard to get there, but you're always glad you came. Life groups are no different than that. Sometimes it's hard to get there, but you're always glad you went. Don't miss it. Groups, don't miss this opportunity. So week one, who am I? This first subject that we're going to cover is this. Who am I when I don't think I measure up? Who am I when I don't think I measure up? So let me tell you something about humanity that you probably know, but I'm just going to highlight for you. We start comparing ourselves to others within days of being born. Did you know this? Did you know that within days you begin to be compared to one another? Every dad in the room knows what I'm talking about because you go into your baby's first little appointment and the doctor says what? He says, your baby, your baby is in the 99th percentile of height. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah, he, he got it for me. And that's just his head. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> I'm just playing. Yeah, I knew the Joneses were great. You know, he's also going to get your bald, your bald spot, so don't worry about it. You know, we just, we, we do it in church too. You know, sisters walking in comparing hats to each other. Does anybody still do that? No. No, no church hats up in here? Okay. Must be one of those modern churches. No hats. Can't believe it. 
But we do it. We do it in church too. Because when you go pick up your kid, you look little Johnny. He's got his coloring page, and you you're, you're going to say, "Yeah, good job, little Johnny." But then you can't help but notice little Susie's coloring page, and she used three different kinds of green for her grass. And then she did some shadowing. And then she put a happy little bush right here and a happy little cloud. And you start thinking, do I need to put Johnny in art school? Does he? He's five, bro. Don't worry about it. Just tell him he did a good job. But we compare, don't we? Yeah. We do it. We do it. We compare ourselves to report cards, assessments, and on and on from the very start. We need to evaluate to know if anything is wrong. But it's easy to get caught up in that comparison trap that you might have heard of before. We get trapped in this comparison, addicting to compare. I heard this statistic recently. Um, I don't know if it's true or not. I actually heard it from Pastor Jeff. So if you get mad about this, you can send him an email, not me. All right. But the stat goes like this, that women, I'm already off to a bad start. Women, (laughs) I can see you looking at me. All the ladies are like, "Uh uh-huh. And what about women? Women look in the mirror on average 16 times a day, 16 times a day. That's a lot, you know? And you know, I like, you know, you look in and you look at the hair and you got the, you're looking and you're like, you look in. But, you know, ladies, I, I, I got ladies in my house and they're looking to see if their hair is right and their makeup's done. And, you know, the stat goes on that men look in the mirror on average 23 times a day. Now, if you don't like it, you know, you can email Pastor Jeff at Je- Pastor Jeff at milestonechurch.com. It's his thing. I don't really know. But 23, I mean, and let me tell you about men. This is ridiculous. Now, I can speak to this. We start losing the hair on our head, and where does it start coming out at? Your back, your ears, your nose. You got it everywhere except where you want it, and you got bushy old nose hairs coming out, bushy old ear hairs coming out. And what do men do? They look right in the mirror. Oh, yeah, you still got it. <laughs> Looking at yourself like, man, you got brain damage, dude. You don't look good. You don't look good, all right? You're like losing all your hair, and it's coming out your face, and it's, I mean, what's wrong with us? What's wrong? I'll prove it to you. This is true. I'm not making this up. I shouldn't have laughed after I said that. I go to the gym a lot. I go to the gym. I'm kind of a gym rat. I know it doesn't look like it, but you're going to have to take my word on it. And I go in there, and there's brother in there. Brother in there. Poor little brother probably weighs 111 pounds soaking wet, okay? Okay, he's just got arms like that. He's got legs like this. He's wearing like a small wife beater, and it's still baggy, you know? Oh, it's all right, man. You just keep working. And he, no, 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 no. Let me finish the story, okay? He's, he, he's on the bicep machine. You know, it's got like the one plate. Oh, he's feeling it. All right, he's got the veins going. And then what does he do? He walks straight up to the mirror. baggy wife beater on like and I'm looking at him going bro what are you doing man you're like you're embarrassing men everywhere men every 23 times a day and I I believe it because men are looking at themselves like man boy you got it and that that you yeah you got it oh my gosh it's too much it used to be mirrors and magazine covers were the only way we could really compare ourselves to others it used to be that way now we have social media Amen, somebody? We got in our pockets, we got 24-7 ability to compare yourself to everyone else's life, 24-7. Back in the day, magazine covers, mirrors, and then other than that, you were just, you were just engaged with people. Now, it's a lot different now, and I love and hate social media. Let me tell you why, because I'm not against social media. I kind of like, I want to do a good job there. I'm like sitting in my garage, in my office all day writing, and so I'm not out as much as I really want to be. So I like the idea of the fact that I could be online and like encourage somebody, almost twice as many followers as me at the gym yesterday. Yeah, it's, it's embarrassing and it's just, it's humbling, you know, we have to humble ourselves. It was crazy, but like I try to do a good job and I love that idea, but it's, I also hate it. I also hate social media. I love it and I hate it. I hate it because I follow all of my successful pastor friends. And um, when we're launching life groups, And then I am on social media, and I see Pastor Jeff is launching 700 life groups this week. It's really easy to begin to compare myself and go, he's only like 10 years older than me. Like, it's just so, it's crazy how easy it is. Is it just me? No, it's not. I don't think so, is it? It's easy. It's easy to compare ourselves to others. I think deep down, everyone has moments where they don't think 
that they're good enough. People, we don't think that we're good enough and we, we evaluate ourselves. Moms, moms feel all the pressures to be super mom. Let me just tell you about it. Super moms and they, you gotta have the best Pinterest page. All right, you gotta do hot yoga three times a week, right? You have to. Uh, you have to have a corn syrup free, gluten free uh, home with, with keto meals every single night. Your kids have to be in the 24th percentile of reading, but, and, and then they go, you're like, oh, I'm a failure as a mom because they have a low reading score. I'm like, uh. but you have to do all these things because you're constantly comparing yourselves to the best moms in the entire world. Moms feel a lot of pressure, or maybe you want to be a mom, but you're not, and that's pressure. And people that you're, are your age are married and having kids, and you're like, well, wait a minute. Well, maybe you're a mom and you're working, so you're not able to do all the things that you think you're supposed to do because you're balancing full-time work and then you're balancing being a great mom. And it's just, there's just a lot of pressure there. How about dads? How about men? Let's talk about some of the pressures that men have. Feel the pressure to provide, man. Like if you're not providing, who are you? You need to be the big provider. You know, you have all your bucket list items checked. You got to have your retirement full. You got to have plenty of money for all your kids to go to college. You're comparing your house, your car, and your vacation to your, you know, your neighbor Bill, and you're comparing yourself to his car, vacation, and retirement account. You're just comparing yourself to others. And on top of that, you come to church and you're told things like, you need to be the spiritual leader of your house. And you're like, ooh, well, I how do I do that? I don't even think I pray better than my wife. That's real. That's real, man. Like, I, I, I know it because I'm married up spiritually. My wife was saved her whole life, been leading groups of mission teams, and I hadn't even been to church yet. So how do you think I feel? Like, we all, we all feel that pressure. It's like, I'm supposed to be a spiritual leader, but I'm sure my wife is more spiritual than me. It's pressure. It is pressure. And I could spend all day talking to you just about that concept alone, but I'm just trying to highlight the fact that there is so much pressure to measure up. There's so much pressure to measure. Teens, do you remember what it feels like to be a teenager for crying out loud? It's ridiculous. The emotions, the, the hormones, amen, <laughs> the constant pressure to fit in, penalized for any unique differences you have, surrounded by social media, comparing other people's highlight reel to your real life. Parents, Tell your kids that you're proud of them. Tell your kids you're proud of them because they look over at their friends and they see that their friends are doing a good job, but they don't feel it. They don't feel that they're doing a good job. You need to tell them that they're doing a good job. They need to hear it. Young adults, you need to finish college, pay off college, get a job as good as your friends, get married before your friends, but all your friends beat you to the altar. You still have college debt and you hate your job. There's pressure there, man. I don't care who you are. The biggest problem with feeling like we don't measure up for any, any category is the perspective of what God says about us. We lose track of who God says we are when we compare ourselves to where we think we should be with people next to us. There's a story in the Bible that can help us tremendously. So let's dive into the content today. It's a story about Moses. You may have heard about him. Uh, Moses struggled with his identity greatly, maybe more than anybody else in the entire Bible. He was born during a time where all the kids, all the boys, excuse me, were being killed in the land of Egypt. So they were slaves in the land, and the Pharaoh was like, all right, let's just murder all the boys that are going to be born because I don't want these Israelites to get out of control. I don't want them to get out of control. So he was plucked out of that. He was plucked out of that, put into a basket, floated down the river. Princess saves him, and he was raised as an Egyptian, in Egyptian royalty. But he hit a bump in the road at 40 years old. He, he was so passionate about defending his own people because I'm sure he had heard about how he was brought in. I'm sure he realized that he was a little bit different than everybody else. And he murdered an Egyptian who was oppressing the Hebrew, one of his fellow Hebrews, okay? And this is powerful because, because he thought because he made a mistake, he thought he was a mistake. <laughs> I want to tell some of you, just because you made a mistake doesn't mean you are a mistake. Just because you've made mistakes doesn't mean you are a mistake. God can still use you, but, he, but Moses did what many of us do. When we make a mistake, he ran and hid. He didn't, he didn't want to be seen. He just wanted to run away from his problems. And at 80 years old, so he was wandering for 40 years. He was 40 years old when that happened, ran away, and then became a, a shepherd. And then he, at 80 years old, this is where we pick up the story, where God meets him in a burning 
bush. Uh, a big fancy Bible word would be this is a theophany. This is like an Old Testament appearance of God or even Jesus, some might say. Um, this is not an angel speaking to him. This is the Lord himself speaking to him. And it goes on like this. In Exodus 3, go ahead and check it out goes like this. Now go. This is God speaking to Moses. For I'm sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people Israel out of Egypt. But Moses protested to God, and here it is, who am I? Who, who am I? Who am I that I would lead the people out of Egypt, that I, would, that I would come before Pharaoh? Notice the insecurity that Moses starts with. Moses' first question, he didn't even know his identity, and for good cause. I mean, think about it. He is an Israelite born that way, but he was raised in an Egyptian palace. So he wasn't raised with his own people. So there's insecurity there, but then he's raised in an Egyptian palace, but he knows he's not Egyptian. So there's no, he had no people that he really truly felt like he identified with because he wasn't raised with his own people. And the people he was raised with weren't his people. Do you understand it? Like truly, and for good cause, he had identity issues. Can you see like why that would be? <laughs> you can see why that would be. And on top of all that, the only thing he knew for sure is that he had screwed up big time. He had messed up big time. He had murdered before he left Egypt, and he ran away from everyone and from God. Think about it. I'm sure he knew the story of his own miracle salvation. I'm sure he knew. Like, someone sat him down one day, I'm sure, and told him, listen, man, you were picked up out of the, the river during a time when everyone was being murdered. Like, listen up. This is how it happened. Even with him knowing all that, he couldn't get past his crippling insecurity. I mean, think about it. You're the only person born. You're the only man born. Like, think about it just in our nation. In all America, all the, all the boys are, are, are being killed, and you're the only one who made it in your generation. Do you think God may have a purpose for you? Probably, right? But even in the midst of that reality, he said, oh, who am I? Moses, let me tell you who you are. But let me tell you why this is so powerful. Let me tell you why we struggle with this. The more disconnected you are from God, the more you struggle with your identity. Write that in your notes. If you're a note taker, note takers go to heaven. Amen. <laughs> Write this down in your notes. Talk about it in your life group. Talk about it in your life group. The more disconnected you are from God, the more you will struggle with your identity. Despite Moses' disconnection, and God shows up to him supernaturally, and God says to him, I know who you are. I haven't given up on you. And for some of you here today, I need to tell you that you are not too old. You are not too young. You are not too much of an addict. You are not too much of a screw up for God to use you. You are never too messed up for God to redeem you. Maybe you've been through some things. Maybe your, your story's a little like mine, and you've been through a lot of really hard stuff, and you've been through some stuff. Maybe you even know God has a plan for you, but you feel like you lost it. The story of Moses teaches us this one clear truth. If you are not dead, God is not done with you. God can work with you. God wants to redeem you and bring you back to life. Even if you've made mistakes, he can still work with you. That's a great place to say amen. Amen. The story goes on, Exodus 3. Moses protested still. He said, I, if I go to the people of Israel and tell them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they will ask, what is his name? What should I tell them? Then God replied to Moses, watch the security. I am who I am. <laughs> like, what? I don't need to explain to you. Leave that, leave that scripture up. I want to look at this. God says, I don't need to explain to you how I created man out of dust. I don't need to explain to you how I saved Noah and his family from the flood. I don't need to explain to you how I gave Abraham a baby as he was over 100 years old. I don't need to give you my resume. I am who I am. So Moses was super insecure, but look how secure God's answer is. I could, we could do a whole series on this I am statement. Some of you know, if you like read the Bible, this is like a title. That's the statement that almost got Jesus stoned to death is because he said be, before he was, I am. He said it, I am. He said it the same way God said it, which is powerful. But I don't have time today to just break that all down to you. This answer is powerful. God's answer to Moses' is, who am I question is you may not know who you are, but the creator of the universe says, I know who I am and I made you. And I don't make junk. And I make people who uh, can be used, who are humble, who can be used by God. I, you may not know who you are, but God says, I know who I am. And that's where your security comes from anyway, is from me, not from yourself. That's what God says to his people. 
And that should have settled it, right? That's, if I'm Moses right there, hopefully, I, don't know, I like to think, I would just say, all right, God, you got it. Let's load up the camels and let's go to Egypt. Let's do this. Like that would just settle it right then and there. I am who I am, but no. The conversation goes on, Exodus 4, Moses protested again. What if they don't believe me or listen to me? What if they say the Lord never appeared to you? And God goes on to tell him, you can read the story yourself. It'll only take you a few minutes for God to, exp- and God explains, man, I'm going to show you miracle after miracle. You'll be able to throw your staff down on the ground. It's going to turn into a snake. All kinds of crazy stuff. going to make it rain frogs. Like, okay, cool. Like, if that's your flex, God, then you do what you want to do. But God is trying to tell him, dude, I'm going to be with you, man. I'm going to go with you. I'm going to go before you with miraculous signs. You think that's enough for Moses? No. No, it's not. Exodus 4.10 goes on to say, but Moses pleaded with the Lord, oh, Lord, I'm not very good with words. I never have been, not even now. Even as you spoke to me, I get tongue-tied. My words get tangled. Then the Lord asked Moses, who made your mouth? Dude, like, why are we still talking about this? It's embarrassing how long this back and forth goes on for, honestly. He's talking to a bush. A bush. It's on fire. What? Like, come on, man. Like, this is, this is, like, can't you just do what the bush says? Wow. Who makes a person's mouth? Who decides whether people speak or don't speak, hear or don't hear, see and don't see? Is it not I, the Lord? Watch what God does. God, every time Moses is insecure, he takes the, the focus off of Moses' inability and turns it to God's ability. He turns it to his own ability. Oh, you don't have the ability? Don't worry, I do. Every time. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Now go. I will be with you as you speak. I will instruct you in what to say. But Moses again pleaded, Lord, just send someone else. Come on, who's been there? Lord, I just don't want to, man. I'm out of excuses. Just, just no. Just no. At, no. No. But I'm going to. No. No. I don't want to. God makes it so clear. I'm going to take care of everything. I'm going to take care of everything. Moses' insecurity had him by the throat. And here's the fact. If God made you and he called you, he can work through you. Let me hit you with the truth bomb today. Write this in your notes. God doesn't just work around our insecurities. He works through them. That's what the story of Moses really teaches us. Do you think, do you think God couldn't have picked someone else that was a little less whiny? Honestly, this is the people that the patriarchs all look back to, the law of Moses. This is the man, hindsight being 2020. But don't you think God could have chosen someone that would have been a little less argumentative? Maybe God is trying to paint a picture for us. Maybe there's something that we can draw out of this that even if you feel so down, so low, so insecure. God is trying to teach us. He doesn't just want to go around people with insecurity and, oh, okay, you're not good at that, so we won't make you do that. No, I want to work through your insecurity. I was just talking to someone this morning saying, oh, man, I know I have a a testimony. I know I have a calling. I know I can bring something, but I'm just not so good at speaking. And I was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to hit you with this message today, (laughs) today, because the worse you are as a speaker, the more God shines. I mean, look at me. <laughs> look at me. I need a whole TV to hold all my notes. You know, it's like I've got to basically, just so I don't forget what I'm supposed to say, like God gets all the glory because I'm not that good. And when it comes to insecurity, I need to tell you the wrong way first. There's two ways that we run from insecurity that are inappropriate that I need to share with you. The first one, write this in your notes if you're taking notes. The first, the first one is pride because it's not always that, that poor me mentality that Moses walking around. Sometimes people walk in, if, because they're insecure, they say things like, I'll show them I'm good enough. I'll show you I'm good enough. I'll be the best. I don't need you or anybody. I will take care of this all by myself. And sometimes the strongest looking person in the room is one of the most insecure. Did you all know that? Somebody who walks around, be, oh yeah, I got this. Yeah, let me tell you about everything I've done. Yeah, let me tell you about, yeah, this is my business and everything. And it, it turns people into overachievers because they feel that their identity is based on their accomplishments. And so they're walking around in pride. But what they're really doing is running away from feeling insecure about themselves because they don't have security that comes from the Lord that says, I don't need, I don't need seven figures to feel like I'm valuable. 
I'm not against people starting businesses and making lots of money and being truly successful in life. I believe Christians should be doing that more often, honestly. I think so. We should be the head, not the tail. But when it's pride that's driving it, it becomes an unhealthy thing. The second thing is this. The second way we run from insecurity is through a spirit of rejection. Rejection. This is, this is what we see a lot of. Sometimes, you know, that, oh, you know, like Moses was definitely walking in this. I'm not good enough. Oh, I'll never be good enough. No one's going to help me. And the thing about the spirit of rejection, it, be, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Because you walk around with that rejection mindset and people get tired of it. Because they, they, they constantly have to prop you up. You have to, they have to constantly prop you up, so it's exhausting to be around people like that for too long, and so that's how it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. You're walking around in rejection, and you end up getting rejected more often because you're, you're so needy. I'm not saying anybody here is doing that. I'm just saying these are the unhealthy ways that we deal with insecurity is through pride and rejection. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy there. I know. So I want to give you four ways that you can overcome your insecurity and actually walk in it in a healthy way. And so let me just explain this to you. I want you to talk about these in your life group. These are in your bulletin notes. There should be four ways. And the first one goes like this. Don't put your identity in anything that can't sustain it. Amen. Let me tell you about Moses. Moses put his security in two things. He put his security in people's approval of him and his ability. And Moses knew he had neither, so he was supremely in, you know, insecure. Because he put his identity in those two things. Not even with a burning bush was he able to walk through it. People's approval will never be able to sustain your identity. I'll show you. The people who love you today may not love you tomorrow. I'm a pastor of a church, right? My wife and I have been pastoring for 10 years. Tiffany's a pastor. She knows this full well. She's been preaching a lot longer than me. And so she knows this about about the reality of of how a pastor could get sucked into that. There's two statements I hear quite often. Um, let me, let me share them with you. The first one is this, oh, oh, pastor, I just loved your message. It was so good. Changed my life. Changed my life. We just, I just loved it so much. And the same day, you could hear, pastor, we're just not being fed here, so I'm going to go. And I could hear the same statement. I could hear both of those statements in one day. Can you imagine how bipolar I would be if I put my identity in people's approval? You would not enjoy it. You would not enjoy it for either one of us if we, if we walked in that people's approval. You can get a thousand likes on Instagram today, and tomorrow you can get backlash for something you didn't even know was in the background. You, you understand what I'm saying? People's approval will never satisfy you Amen. because you have to constantly chase it, chase it, chase it, and it's fleeting. It's absolutely fleeting. And your ability, your ability can't sustain your identity. Watch. This is why college athletes that, like, suffer an injury do very poorly in life because their identity is based on what they do, based on what you do. But your identity is not based on what you do. It's based on who you are in Christ. And that is why if you put your identity in in things like this, you have the greatest potential for insecurity in the things that you put your identity in. So if you're an athlete, if you're a businessman, if if you're with your friend group, you know, and you put your identity there because I'm one of these guys. I did that as a kid growing up. I belonged to the skater you know, crew, you know, and I put my identity there. And so that was where I was most secure, most insecure, excuse me. So I always wanted to like protect that. And I needed to constantly make people think like I'm that because I was trying to protect my identity because I didn't find my identity in Christ. It's, it's tragic. It's tragic. Listen, so let me prove it to you and, and just be vulnerable. This is a message that uh, invites a lot of vulnerability. So I'm going to share some vulnerability with you. Um, this might be really surprising, might be really surprising, but I'm not the best preacher in the world. I know, I know you're like, what, what, no, I was going to call you Elliot Furtick, I thought you were like that, good, no, I'm, it's no surprise, I'm not the best preacher, well, I'm not the best preacher in town either, <laughs> it gets worse, it gets worse, I'm not the best preacher in my friend group, all right, this is getting rougher and rougher, I'm just, I know that I don't measure up in that area. Can you imagine how insecure I'd be if I put my identity there? Believe me, I've done it. I've done it. Because this is something we have to monitor all the time. We have to watch where we're putting our identity, where we're throwing our attention to say, this is who I am. It's only when people say, oh, man, service was so good. That's the only time I feel like I'm doing okay. 
No, how about I put my identity in, I'm obedient to what God called me to do, and if he called me to do it, he'll go with me, and it doesn't matter what anybody says about me or how good or bad I am at it. It's only that I'm going to be obedient to Christ. If you could get that today, it would change your whole life. It would change your whole life. To say it doesn't matter how good if people approve of me. It doesn't matter how good or bad I am at whatever. I, it, the only thing where I get my identity is, o, is obeying God and saying, and saying, I will do what you say, Lord, and I will walk into it, and I will be obedient to you. Let that be your identity. Number two is this. Let your weakness become God's strength. Let your weakness become God's strength. So if what I said was true about that, then weakness and inability becomes where God shines the most, Right? That's where God actually gets the flex, is where you're not good. Listen to what Paul said in 2 Corinthians. He was uh, writing writing to the Corinthians about he had a problem. That's all right. Leave that up. It's right here. And and Paul was was about to, he was, before this, he was saying, Lord, would you please take this problem away from me? I've got this issue. He didn't say what it was. He just called it a thorn in his side. I think he was intentionally vague because he didn't want the entire human race to know about it. Maybe, I don't know. (laughs) But he was asking God to take it away, and this is what God said. Each time God said to Paul, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast in my weakness so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's powerful. We tend to see our weaknesses as limits, as liabilities, as excuses, as as reasons for failure. You know what the number one category in bookstores is? self-help. Why? Because we're always trying to fix what's wrong with us. We look at our, we look at our weaknesses and our, and our failings, our shortcomings as things we need to fix. We need to fix ourselves because we're broken and I'm not good enough until I'm good enough. Hey, and I, I love a little self-help every once in a while. I like to work hard. I like to be disciplined. It's not where my identity is though. It's not where my identity is. We need to fix our weaknesses, but God sees our weaknesses as his opportunity. It's a paradigm shift. It's a shift in the way that you look at life, that God would actually use our weaknesses more than he would our strengths. I was never a leader growing up. I was never a speaker growing up. I was a class clown, always getting like, I was just turning the attention away from myself because I was so insecure. It's God's weakness that gets glory. So the minute I start thinking, oh, well, I I think I got this, is the minute that God's going to humble me again. (laughs) and remind me, hey, it's not you, bud. It's not you, bud. It doesn't need to be you. It's me. It's always been me. We tend to focus on, instead of embracing our weaknesses, we tend to focus on what you can't do rather than what God can do through obedience, through obedience. Number three is this. Submit what you think and say to the truth of God's word. Submit what you think and say to the truth of God's word because the truth is, is, is what we say is often a result of what we think. I hear people say, oh, I didn't mean to say that. What they meant to say was, um, that's what I was thinking, but I couldn't keep my mouth from saying it because I didn't want to say it, and I didn't want you to hear what I was thinking is what they meant to say. <laughs> that's what they meant, because you can't, it's, it's an overflow of the heart. The mouth speaks, all right? So how do we change what's our thinking? How do we change what's in our mind? Listen to what Romans uh, 12, 3 says. This is Paul writing again. Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment and according to the faith that God has distributed to each of you. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And we need to have sober judgment about what the word of God says about us. How? We do that by reading our Bible, having the right people in our lives and having the right things flowing into your mind and your heart through your eyes and your ears. Let me explain that. Um, I I preached whole messages about this. I think it's really, really important, especially in our society with so much TV, so much media, so much social media, all of that, that the gates that goes into my heart is here and here. How else can I ingest Really, any message that God has for you, I either need to see it or I need to hear it. So everything that we look at, everything that we hear is actually flowing in. That's why we need to be so careful about the things that are coming into our eyes and our ears. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm no different than anyone. I got a phone. I got TV just like everyone. And it's crazy out there. So we need to take in the truth, but we also need to prevent some of the lies that are flowing into our lives. Like, you know, like, you'll, 
you, you see things, and we just we see it so often we ignore it, but we hear statements like, yeah, you're only a man. You're a real man if you use this body wash. You're a, re- you're a real woman, and men will love you if you use this shampoo. It's like, it's so silly and, and stupid, right? But like, take a look again at a lot of the advertising that we see today. It's like sub, you know, subconsciously and sometimes overtly like you're not anything unless, you're, unless you use this product. Because marketing is often just uh, it's identity. They're trying to give you identity. They are not stupid. They know what they're doing. These marketers, these advertisers, they want to give you the beauty that you want, the manliness that you want, the acceptance that you want. And it comes across as silly, but on the inside, you're like, well, I want to be handsome. <laughs> well, I, w- I want to be pretty. I want my wife to smell on me, <laughs> you know, like this. But over time, we begin to, we begin to forget the truth that you're a real man when you, when you walk in the things of Christ. Like, that's the, that's the reality, but that's why we have to be so careful. How did the devil tempt Jesus by saying, if you are the, the son of God, then you'll do this? It was like marketing. It was like, who's a marketing major here? It was like marketing. Well, if, if you want to be the son of God, then you better turn this rock into bread because then, then you'll be it. But, but how did Jesus respond? Always with the Bible, always with the word, the Old Testament scriptures, because that truth was more realer than the truth that he was being, that was being marketed to him. Why am I talking about marketing so much? I don't know. Let's move on. We got to talk. We got to get on a Bible reading plan. If you want the right things in your life, get on a Bible reading plan, download that YouVersion Bible app, get on with some friends, monitor your media intake. Let me give you a a little practical tip. If you're scrolling or whatever, and you see something you don't want to see anymore, don't message the company. I'm serious. People message the church. I already go to church. I'm like, well, because you messaged me, you're going to see Lifeline Church over and over again for the next 30 days nonstop. Let me explain to you what I should explain to them. If you don't want to see it, there's three little dots in the top right. Tap it and say, I don't want to see that. You can do that with anything you want. I don't want to see that. Every January or so, we, we do fasting, and I say, just put it all away. But real life, most people are going to use social media. But did you know you can, you can tell it? No, I don't want to see that. No, I don't want to see that either. No, whoa, I don't want to see that. <laughs> all the men said amen. I don't want to see that. Man, it's too much. But if you, get, if you get into a Bible reading plan, if you jump into a group that we have available for every single person, every day of the week, there's a group. There's a one for you. You can sign up for a group, reading your Bible in the group with the right people saying the right things. It's like the one-two punch for your identity to start being new in him. Last one is this, number four. Focus more on what God is doing rather than in you rather than what others say and think about you. Focus on what God is doing in you more than what others say and think about you. This is a big idea. And this is like, this is wrapping it all up. This is the last point. And this is the one that if you can get this, if you can get this, it's going to change everything in your life. So please, I know we're getting close to the end here and, and it's tempting to just be like, all right, all right, I get it, I get it. But pay attention to this. This is so important. If you want to be the most secure person in the room, listen, if you want to be the most secure person in the room, Don't think about yourself. Think about what God is doing. Think about what God wants to do through you in the life of someone else. This is huge. Because we deal with insecurity. Why? Because we're thinking about ourselves. We're thinking about ourselves instead of thinking about the world around us, the people around us. Your wives, your kids, your your husbands, your families, the, the people in your church. Because we're so focused on self... We become insecure because it, I have to be something. But if we just get that out of our mind and say, you know what, Lord, I just want to focus on what you're doing. I fo- I'm focused on what you want to do in me and through me. Listen to what the author of Hebrews wrote about Moses. Because Moses turned the corner. Moses got it. But the author of Hebrews wrote this about him, and it shows us the answer. Hebrews 11 he regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead. I'll say it again. Because he was looking ahead to his reward. Think about God, who he is, what he's doing through you. Moses overcame and so can you. 
I want to be vulnerable with you just one more time about some of my insecurities. And this, this just happened last week. Uh, I was preaching at the Salvation Army, the place where I graduated in Stockton. I was able to go there and I was able to minister to the men. And you would think by 10 years later that I would be over this. But it was about my turn to go up and start preaching. And they have a, it's, the stage is even taller than this. And it has like this rail on it. And the stairs are on the side. And I was sitting over there and it was my turn. And it's a room full, probably about this many guys that have all been to prison and jail and they've been in their addiction for like 30, 40 years. They're like all bigger and badder than me. For some reason, that's like just like, ugh, makes me nervous, you know, because I want to do a good job. So I grabbed that handrail and started walking up the steps and the thought started. They're going to see right through you. They're going to see that you are no different than them. You're, they're going to see that, that you're not as smart as they think you ought to be. They're going to see they're going to see through you. And I start thinking, oh, what if, I don't, what if I say something wrong? What if I say something that's not theologically accurate? What if I, what if I get it wrong? What if I mess up? And I, I just began to, like, I'm walking up the stairs. Okay, this all happened in an instant, right? But I'm walking up the stairs, and I started to feel it. I started to feel it. And you would think I'd be over it by now, but I'm not. So I have to, re, I have to come back, and this is, this is what I did. This is what I do. Whenever those feelings strike me, I, I just look out, and I, I'm looking, I'm making eye contact with people, and I'm thinking to myself, God, who do you want me to speak to? Who, who can I help? Because it's not about me. And if, I, and if I get outside of myself, and I start looking at, okay, well, this brother right here, I think I can speak something to him. This brother right here, I think God wants to use me. And as soon as I stop thinking about myself, and how good I am, or how good I'm going to perform, or once I get that out of my mind, I start thinking, I wonder if I can really help someone right here. And I shift the, the focus from me to others. <sighs> freedom. It's what freedom feels like. It's what freedom feels like. Do you want to be the most secure person in the room? Walk in, looking around, going, I wonder who I can encourage in here. I wonder who I can help in here. And it's hard. You have to learn how to do it. You have to learn how to do it. You have to train yourself to go, it's not about me. It's about who I can help. It's about who I can encourage. It's about who I can support. It's not about me. And God, it's what you're doing in me and through me. It's not about me anymore. It's not about me. And your insecurities will melt away. Your insecurities will melt away. God uses people who are in touch with the reality that they don't measure up and the fact that they just want to be used by him. Think about Paul, the guy who wrote a lot of the scriptures that we talked about today. The one who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament was a murderer, was a murderer of Christians. And then God restored him and used him to write most of the New Testament. How about Peter? How about Peter? Feed my sheep, Peter. Peter, who on this rock, I'll build my church, he was, he was someone who rejected Jesus just to save face. Just to save face, he rejected Jesus, yet God called him to do all those wonderful things as soon as it wasn't about him. Peter, do you love me? Go look at someone else. Go take care of my sheep. It's not about you. It's not about your ability. How about King David? King David, who wrote a lot of the Psalms and who was the, one of the, he was the second king, but the first good king of Israel. He was, he was a real winner. The murderer, <laughs> adulterer. This guy was a messed up father. Messed up father. Yet God redeemed him and restored him when he got outside of himself. I'm just trying to tell you, nobody is perfect and there's always some way that you don't measure up. Always. Don't, don't, don't think that you're going to finally one day be good enough to not have insecurity. No, it's not going to happen like that. Anyone who thinks otherwise is too proud and deceived to be used. But not here. Not at this church. Not in this family. We are a people who are in touch with the humility to say, no, I don't, I don't need to be perfect. In fact, in my imperfections when God is the best. If you can come to a place where you see your need for God, God can do amazing things in your life. And today is the day to choose that. 
to say, God, I put you first. It's not about me anymore. It's about you and what I, and I want to serve you. And there's some people here today ready to make that decision. And there's others of you that are ready to come back to God in that kind of way to say, Lord, it's, it's not about me. I've tried the world my own way, and I'm not going to do it anymore. I want to come to you, Lord. If that's you today, we're going to pray a prayer in just a moment. Or you're going to have an opportunity to say, Lord, I'm yours. I'm yours. I come to you with, with humility and honor to you. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? This is a sacred moment, so please, let's keep it. There's people in here that are making a, a lifelong decision, so let's respect this moment. It's a holy moment. It's a very sacred moment. And before I make this ask, I'm just going to pray for open hearts and open minds. Father, in Jesus' name, that we would be open to receive your love and your goodness, your grace and your mercy today. But if that's you, and you're ready to say, it's not about me anymore. Lord, I want, I want to make you my Lord and my Savior. Not just my get out of hell free card, my Savior, but I want to make you my Lord and, and live your way. And there's some of you that are going to make that decision for the first time. There's others that are going to come back to him, and I need to speak to you. I feel I need to tell you that even if you've messed up and you're trying to come back into that relationship, that you should feel no shame or guilt for the decision you're about to make. Our Heavenly Father is different than any earthly father that has ever lived. He always comes running to us. So if that's you, and you're ready to make that decision today, would you just lift your hand for me and just say, that's me. I want to give my life to Jesus. Amen, 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 amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Church, can we pray this prayer together? No one feeling left out. No one feeling alone in this place. This is a family. Would you welcome in your family by saying this prayer with me? Say, Father God, Father God I give my heart to you. I give my, heart to you. I give my life to you. Forgive me of my sin. Make me clean. Fill me with your spirit. And guide me in this life. Amen. Can we celebrate everyone that made that decision today?